How's it going? Charles Botenston here, and we're going to be doing a little q and I know this is your favorite part of the video. Who cares about the numbers? Let's find out what Charles has to say about real estate. Uh, we get some really interesting questions. I'm going to try and keep it short. Number one is because my battery and my camera is going to die soon. And number two is that we have a lot of questions. So the first one is, how many showings until I get a signed lease? Um, well, that really depends. You can get it on the first one, you can get it on the second one, and or it could be on the 30th one. You know, I, I had a, an exclusive down in the West Village, and literally for 30 days, we had like five showings. On the 30th day, two offers came in. It was like out of nowhere. So you have no idea when you're gonna get an offer or a signed lease, um, <laughs> which actually leads into question number two, which says offer came in too early, question mark. Um, in other words, they put it on the home or they put it on the market and they got an offer too soon. Uh, those are the serious buyers. Those are the buyers that have been looking for months. They see the home, they want the home, they take the home. You have to work with those offers because those are the ones, like I said, that are serious, but if you lose them, you don't even know when the next one's gonna come in. So you have to work with those early ones. I like, oh, I tell that to owners and I know it's so hard because like we just put it on. Let's see if we wait and get something better. It never, never works out that way. Um, parents may move in with us in the future. Uh, yeah, no, that, that should be fine if it's a condo. For a co-op, you have to ask for approval. And I know it sounds really bad, they can deny you. I do know a situation where they actually revoked the proprietary lease on the co-op. So you have the proprietary lease, which gives you the ability to live there. Even though you have shares in the corporation, shares to actually live in the space, you have a lease to actually live where the shares are. And I know someone that the, the co-op revoked the pri proprietary lease, which then forced them to sell the shares because they weren't actually able to live there there and they couldn't actually put someone in there to live there. Uh, here we go. This is actually a really good question. Mother's Day open house. Uh, obviously Mother's Day has passed, but anytime there's any religious holiday, any national holiday, any kind of holiday, and this is actually very interesting, is that no, I would not do an open house on Mother's Day. Number one is that there's not going to be any buyers. Uh, number two, well, if there are, they're really serious. Also, this is really interesting, is that if New York City had a week of really bad weather and then the weekend is beautiful. I also, I'm like, yeah, it's good to put your home on the market, but those are the weekends that everyone leaves town. So as much as you're like, it's a beautiful weekend, there's gonna be a lot of people, there's a lot of people that are like, this was a terrible week of weather, I need to get out of the city, and then they go to their homes out east, in the Hamptons, or Jersey Shore, or their cabin up in Rhinebeck, New York, where my grandma has a home. <laughs> uh, not sure if I need a real estate broker or real estate attorney. You don't need a broker, or but you do need an attorney. I do know someone, uh, actually a really good friend of mine, she was going through the transaction. She literally signed the contract. She was going through board approval, and she was about to close, and my mom told me, she goes, oh, by the way, they're buying the home without an attorney, is that legal? I'm like, uh, no, and she's not protected. Like, that's insane. So we got her a real estate age, uh, I'm sorry, we got her a real estate attorney. So yes, you need a real estate attorney, you don't need a real estate broker. The biggest thing on a real estate broker, you know, obviously I'm not gonna like tout, you know, uh, you know, if you want to use them, obviously myself or whoever you want, but I'm the best. But this is what I've noticed is that people don't like confrontation. They don't like asking for things. Like I'll have clients that are like, well, let's try and push out the closing date, but if it doesn't work out, don't worry about it. I'm like, what are you talking? I'm like, do you want the closing date out here? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, well then let's do that. Like why? Yeah, let's go in and get what we want. So what I've noticed is that people have softened up in New York City. They're like, well, I just don't want to get into the confrontation. I don't want, you know, yeah, there's some people that are like, yeah, I want this. Even with the pricing, I'm like, yeah, let's get a higher price. Let's go for it. Who cares? Like, what do we have to lose? And I'm the one that actually pushes them. They're not pushing me. So I've said it for a while is that 95% of the brokers in New York City, they're not that good. But obviously, there's it's like a bell curve. In other words, you have really good brokers, and then you have average brokers, and then you have terrible brokers. So, you know bring up the uh, little science, but 5% of the brokers are absolutely rock stars and they know exactly what they're doing. They will give you an amazing transaction. They will give you an experience that you've wanted and you wished for. And that's what, and I don't want to say myself, but that's what I prided myself on and that's why we work by referral and we, I have like 90% of our businesses by referral because we're willing to push forward. If your agent is not willing to push against the uncomfortable situation of pushing the closing date out, adding the chandelier to the transaction, saying something about, I don't know, including storage or whatever, then fire them. And I recently picked up a client because someone got fired and they're like, yeah, you, we need to hire you. And you know, they're really happy. And actually, we're working on a uh, charity event. Uh, landlord failed to return security. I'm actually going through this right now. Uh, my landlord, I'm not gonna say the name, 
Uh, they are taking a while to return the security. In this case, I'm not gonna take them to court because they have something called landlord tenant court. And if you are a tenant and you've ever taken or your landlord has taken you to court or you've taken a landlord to court, you'll not be able to rent in New York City because no landlord wants one of those people in their building. So they'll deny you if you've ever gone to court with a landlord. It stinks, I understand, but it's the reality. So I'm not gonna take my landlord to court. It's just not worth it. But I, you know, just prodding and being persistent is the best way to go. Moving on, two more questions. Uh, this is actually a great question. I talked about the numbers in the other video. Uh, they said, just curious for a budget of 1.5 million for a two bed, two bath, is it better to buy a condo in downtown Brooklyn or a co-op in Manhattan? This is a fantastic question. I'm very bullish on Manhattan. Obviously, it depends on your needs. If, you're, if you want space, do Brooklyn. If you want the location, do Manhattan. I love Manhattan. I'm a single guy as well, so I don't know if, if the second bedroom is for children, for home office, for parents, for visitors. I don't know what, what your entire needs are for, but they mentioned Manhattan, Sutton Place. I have clients in Sutton Place. They love it. I, I highly recommend that you first start in Manhattan. If you don't like the con, uh, the co-ops there, then go to Brooklyn for condos. But you also have to make sure that you're qualified. The co-ops are getting really, really challenging right now because they have so many buyers out there that they're able to actually be picky. So the last question is, rental prices are up 47% since 2010. And it's a statement, and there's no question, but I'm assuming the question is like, really? And this is to be accepted, this is to be accepted. Accepted, accepted, accepted. 2008, we went down in the actual uh, market. 2009, it was stagnant. 2010, we started coming out. We've been through six years of growth, six dramatic years of growth. Average sales price up. The amount, like, the average sales price completely blown out of the water. The highest priced homes being put on the market, being sold completely. All records are being broken. And this is to be expected in ev after every recession. We, it just gets a little bit more expensive. It's, it's how it is. It happened in the 80s, happened in the 90s, happened in the 2000s. 2000s, and then we had recessions in between all the. You had the, the oil crisis, you had the dot com, you had 9 11, and then you had uh, the most recent recession, and then there's gonna be another recession, then it's gonna take off. And this is the hardest thing is convincing a client that it's a good time to buy in a recession because the media is not on your side, the banks, employment, average sales price, transactions, everything is against you, maybe even interest rates and it makes it more expensive to buy and you're hesitant, am I gonna have a job, am I gonna be able to afford it, I have a college tuition to pay for, I have a business to run, I don't know if my commission is gonna be this high, there's so many things. And in 2009, I just remember all the phone calls that I made to all my clients and some of them even were crying, they're like, I don't know if this is the right decision, they made tenfold. So this is correct and the reason it's correct is because the people that actually took advantage of this market in 2008, 2009, 2010, they made it because they were the risky ones. They were the risk takers. So when the next recession hit or any future recessions, that's the time to buy. And the easiest way to actually know when there's a recession, A, is watch these videos, but B is that it's usually every six to seven years of growth after a recession, not when it starts, but after the recession. This was, it was clear in 2010 that it was stabilized. The market was stabilized. So if you have any questions, I hope this was uh, very informative. I love the Q&A section. I love giving out the numbers in the other videos. If you have any questions, shoot me an email, leave in the comments below.